Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, t'was sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as silent as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere nor any drop to drink. Water is an access resource. In other words, it's the resource that underpins all the others, energy, minerals, and food. <coughs> the world's population has tripled in the 20th century, but the demand for water has grown six times. So, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. What are we doing about it? So there hasn't really been, in my view, a lot of really cutting edge innovation, funding and creativity around water. Let me start by talking about South Africa's time bomb, which I'm sure all of you are aware, are aware of is acid mine drainage. In South Africa, there are megaliters of acid mine drainage being produced, and the current solution is neutralization. The water itself still contains <coughs> the sulfates, hmm. And the plan is to pump that back into rivers with the idea that the solution to pollution is dilution. So what about reverse osmosis, which is probably the most widely used uh, water treatment technology around today? If you take contaminated water, extract fresh water, you're going to be left with everything else behind in what's called a hypersaline brine which actually is still a significant amount of water. What gets done with that? Mm. At the moment, the solution is to put it into a pond. Life of that pond is about five to 10 years. You have to build a new brine pond every five to 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So that's not a sustainable solution. But what if you could take that brine and deconstruct it and actually recover all of its constituent parts, the water, the individual salts, the metals, the toxins, maybe that would actually turn it around and we'd start to be able to think of this waste as a resource. After all, it does contain all the resources we spend a lot of money trying to extract. So that's really my story tonight about eutectic freeze crystallization. To take this hypersaline brine, cool it down to the point where the water actually freezes out as ice, because it's less dense than the solution, it floats. And at individual temperatures, you crystallize out individual salts. This here is an example of one of these hypersaline brines, nice and dirty. We extract a lot of water. So you can extract about 98% of the water out of this hypersaline brine. We also have a salt, so this is sodium sulfate, which is $260 a ton. So it's not very uh, valuable, but at least it's pure, it's saleable, and potentially usable. And the coal produced a whole field of houses that was made out of gypsum. So potentially we do have not terribly valuable products, but useful products. And if you're dealing with platinum brines or base metal brines, you potentially have valuable metal, pro metal salt products. We've done this process in the lab. We've tested out a range of different brines. We've done the process in batch. We've done it continuously so we can show that we actually have a working process that can produce continuous products. And where are we now? The stage between the laboratory success and commercialization. And to cross it involves many steps. A lot of risk is involved. A lot of money is involved. So what do we need? The first thing I think to be able to have some kind of a mini plant or some demonstration plant on campus that could, be, that could also be moved around to site. I think it is a convincing um, accelera acceleration of commercialization. So of course that requires funding, it requires a lot of support around getting this thing on the go. I also think that as a university, we're better equipped to provide a center of expertise than we are to do commercialization. What we need is support
report around the commercialization, the strategizing, and the business aspects. And for me, it's around building partnerships to let the engineers and the scientists and the university people do what they're good at, but somehow put this other step in place, which is the commercialization step. So I suppose to end off, the three things I'd like to propose are that we need to rethink the problem, reword the problem, and remove the problem. So rethinking it is around changing the mindset from toxins to resources, from waste to value. There's a plant up the west coast which mines um, mineral sands. And they recover the mineral sands and sell those. In the effluent, they have molybdenum and scandium and rare earth metals that in other countries are mined for electronics. But those are waste and those are in the effluent. So for me, it's about turning around the way of thinking about toxins and about resource. So part of that is rewording the problem, which is instead of talking about effluent and waste and waste water, we talk about water refining or resource recovery or words that <coughs> indicate that we're dealing with value and not waste. And for me also part of it is that water is too cheap and water is not valued enough. So I would like to see more value being given in the language that we have in our water. And then, of course, the last part, point would be to remove the problem. I think that we have fantastic resources here, and I think what's needed is just to get onto the next step, and we will be able to really make an impact. So I'd like to end with a quote. For most of human history, water has been the crucial resource. And in coming years, it will reassume its natural domination. H2O will be the defining resource of the 21st century. Thank you. Mm. So, thanks, Alison. That, that was really <coughs> interesting and, and thought-provoking, and yeah, I, I think introduces a new paradigm in the way that we look at waste. Are there any questions? And um, do you really think that it's going to be uh, viable, um, not not on a commercial side, but more on a strategic side, to save, uh, you know? human health and, and food security, rather tackling it that way. The mine drainage problem is a national problem. One of the issues with the gold acid mine drainage is that it contains high levels of uranium, and in those populated areas, the uranium is now in the watercourses. And a lot of the time we end up mining uranium in other circumstances. But the big picture there is the water has to be treated, and the resource has to be recovered. So, so would you be able to recover that uranium in Yes, some yeah. yeah. If you look at your recovery, has anybody done the studies to look how commercially viable the recovery is? So in 2011, there were 16,000 reverse osmosis plants globally. But in 1964, it was considered to be not commercially viable. Too specialized, a bit of a research novelty. Then. The Spanish government, after the Spanish Civil War, wanted to promote tourism on the Canary Islands, and there, were no, there was no natural water. So they installed this kind of experimental reverse osmosis plant, and quickly those technical problems were solved. And now it's absolutely widespread. Because right now, we don't have something that's commercially viable in its current state, but with a little bit of a a leap, I think we can get to a point where we can solve these problems. The second thing is water is too cheap. There's no doubt about it. So it can't compete. I have a background in the mining industry. Surely they would be the kind of people who could make this happen. We've already had, I think it's 13 million rand worth of funding from mostly from the mining industry. So yeah. Anglo Coal, <coughs> a huge amount of our work, all the big mining companies have. They are very keen to take it forward. Now is not such a good time. <laughs> so what do you actually need to take this thing forward? Who needs to make the decision? We're proposing many things. So for our research, my proposal is we should have a center of expertise where we have a training facility, a place where we develop um, <coughs> knowledge, where we solve problems, where we get technically really expert and continue to be. 
think with the mini plant, you, you also will then sort of be able to better <coughs> translate it yeah. for industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to test the, the sort of various types of streams at a larger scale. Just questions just behind? I just wanted to say, I mean, in the EU, their <coughs> approach is generally to um, get kind of as many partners from as many different walks of life as possible, stick them all together and come to some kind of agreement where everybody's going to get some benefit out of that. Is that, I mean, is that a feasible, is that feasible in South Africa? It definitely is a possibility. Two parts. I think this can actually work. Um, are you, how confident are you in this, in this <coughs> process? And then secondly, internationally, what is the sort of feeling about and, and sort of research that's being done on, on, in other countries on this? Um, okay, the answer to the first question is, well, I've seen it work. You can ask my students in the lab. We have a small plant in the lab that works. And at the moment, the, the first two on this list are UCT-centric, so a mini plant and a center of expertise. But there is currently, ESCOM is funding a demonstration plant at an ESCOM site. So there's going to be a, a number of different water treatment sort of technologies, and one of them will be eutectic freeze crystallization. Coltec is also funding a plant which is a bit, they're finding a large scale demonstration plant. So there is already interest from industry. Internationally, there's quite a lot of interest. Our collaborators are Technical University of Delft, and they've done a lot of work on the same process. I mean, how long would it, after the investment, would it take to make it profitable? 10 years? Mm. It's not only going to be about profitability, it's going to be about whether or not you can dispose of your waste using current technology. Okay, that's... And that's answer. already starting to okay, become a driver, that's and that's why they're interested. In Europe, the legislation is much stricter. We still have a situation where you are allowed to create 40 tons a day of hazardous salt. Whereas once that avenue gets shut down, then suddenly this becomes more viable. What, is the, what do you think is the estimated time frame? for testing and research and how long is it going to take to actually implement the in total 18 months to two years. On the technical side, it's in the front of the input area, the energy you need to down the volume of water. What temperatures do you need to get the salts out? So the studies being done at the moment are to compare, we can't compare it to disposal. It's not fair, because it's not really a technology. It's a rubbish dump. So what we've done is compared it to evaporative crystallization, which is the other competing technology. So in other words, vaporizing the water and recovering it through condensation. So evaporation takes six times as much energy as freezing. So already thermodynamically you have a big advantage. It competes favorably with the apple, if you compare apples and apples the evaporative apple. Mm. The studies we've done and the mine waters we've looked at are mostly up to about minus five degrees, which is not very technically challenging. Are you, whether you, you might be aware of any proposed amendments, that uh, regulatory amendments that might push this technology forward? And the second question is um, for technical, whether you need any further chemicals to clean up your precipitants um, and whether those can be reworked into your process. I think in general our legislation is tightening up. Um, the advantage of the process is it doesn't require other chemicals. So once you've precipitate, crystallized out your salt, you would wash it with a saturated solution of your salt and at the end of the day you have a pure salt. Coming back to government, government perspective is not so much one on financial costs. It takes perspective of economic costs, which is a completely different mm. program, social costs, and environmental costs. Mm. If you factor those costs in, the game changes fundamentally. It's about long-term sustainability of the country. So moving to that space and get government on your side. Great, super. Well, thank you all for your, your mm. participation. Brilliant. Good, mm. thank you all for coming. We hope to see you all. <laughs>